glasses to read that Dumb apostles we had But they knew their stories Way back when In the heart of Central Africa, there is a society that lives among themselves in perfect peace. This society incarnates the most profoundly beautiful virtues of our world, the capacity for love, the hatred of violence, and the desire to cooperate. For much of human history, it has been established that the virtue of cooperation between strangers comes naturally to human beings alone. Even chimpanzees, who are highly intelligent animals, cannot cooperate peacefully with strangers to the extent that we humans are capable of. Yet there exists a close and lesser known relative of the chimpanzee, called the bonobo, or panpaniscus, a species capable of cooperation beyond that of humans. This is a species with the most exceptional ability to maintain peace among themselves. What appears primitive on the surface is, underneath, a great labyrinth of emotion and instinct an intricate society that has kept the bonobos alive for millions of years. There are approximately 15,000 bonobos left in the wild. We should note that population estimates are inaccurate and this number could easily be as low as 10,000. Bonobos are expected to go extinct within the next 50 years. Habitat loss is one of the most devastating threats to wild bonobo populations. The exploitation of Central Africa has decimated the Congo Basin rainforest. And by 2050, it's estimated that over a quarter of the rainforest will be gone. Bonobos are the most peaceful animals on the planet. This has allowed human beings to dominate them easily. Poverty, civil instability, and illegal logging are the root causes of declining bonobo populations. Extinction is the fruit of the Industrial Revolution. Education and outreach are essential to the survival of all great apes. If local communities can be saved from starvation and poverty and educated about bonobos, they can become involved in helping to protect the species and their crucial ecosystem. I've become interested in collecting a great deal of information based upon my research about bonobos and their societies in the Congo Basin. This is a synthesized collection of my thoughts, feelings, and research about panpaniscus, and what I deem to be the most vital information and instructions for newcomers in understanding the bonobos and their complicated lives. My second aim is perhaps more ambitious, which is to deliberate on the nature of bonobo society. These animals are highly intelligent and deeply emotional, and I believe that some of the emotions that bonobos feel are beyond even our remarkable brains. Bonobos share 98.7% of their DNA with us, but unlike us, they're cooperative and unassuming. They live in a matriarchy, so a society ruled exclusively by powerful sisterhoods or coalitions of females. Human encroachment upon the bonobos habitat in the Congo Basin rainforest has fractured what little remains of their once bustling society, Compared to other great apes, very little is known about the bonobos. They were the last of the great apes to be discovered. To the Europeans, that is, bonobos were finally distinguished as a species in 1929. Until recently, civil unrest in the Democratic Republic of the Congo made studying bonobos in the wild very difficult. I believe bonobos embody a perfect version of humanity, a peaceful, democratic society with little violence and no murder. Because of female dominance in bonobo society, there's little to no sexual coercion of females by males. 
When a bonobo group meets a group they've never met before, they don't fight for territory nor food. Rather, they exchange greetings, they groom each other, and sometimes they share a snack. It is this penchant for peaceful living that has made bonobos particularly vulnerable to us, because we believe we have dominion over Mother Earth. While males are physically larger, the females rely on their close relationships with each other to pose an even greater threat over a single male who is intellectually and socially incapable of unionizing. Thus, there is a social imperative among the dominant females to remain in peace with each other. If this order is disrupted, the matriarchy will fall apart. This is true of human beings too. The violent and disproportionate physical strength of males over females has instilled within the latter an evolutionary predisposition to compassion and non-violence. Women, as the givers of life, are naturally compelled to reproduce and conserve life through the acts of childbirth and child-raising. These acts are absolutely reflected in the congenital female desire to protect the living earth. Women possess an ethic of caring that is not innately understood by men. I believe there is nothing beyond the power of Mother Earth. The number of wild bonobos has likely been declining since the 1980s and population estimates in recent years are lower than ever. International investors are funding a new post-colonial genocide in the Congo Basin rainforest, subjecting wild bonobos and many other unique species of flora and fauna to illegal logging and unsustainable agriculture. This genocide in the Congo exists in part to reap the rich natural resources of the rainforest, such as palm oil, rubber, cobalt, diamond, gold, and columbite tantalites, a key ingredient in electronic devices. Central Africa has a dire history associated with these exports, which have informed much of its colonial past. In fact, the colonial past of Africa is still being experienced and reproduced in the present day. Between 1885 and 1908, an estimated 10 to 15 million people died as a result of King Leopold II's settlement of the Congo Basin. He ordered his men to behead, assault, and crucify the Congolese natives, all behind the veil of his front organization, the International African Association. The association painted an erroneous picture of the Congo Free State, one in which Leopold was the sole proprietor and benevolent leader of the Congo Basin and his people. In the 1890s, rubber quotas were mandated across Central Africa among natives, and those who failed to meet the collection quotas were mutilated by Leopold's private army, the force public, Usually their hands were cut off. The severed hands of the Congolese natives became a currency for the force public, who rewarded additional wages based upon the number of hands they had collected. Leopold's private ownership of the Congo ended in 1908 when he turned the Congo Free State over to the country of Belgium, marking the beginning of the Belgian Congo, which lasted until 1960. As a result of Leopold's economic policies, which inherently overvalued the export of raw materials, the internal wealth of Central Africa could not be restored. To this day, the Congo is a region characterized by extreme economic dependency and a profound inability to generate internal wealth. Leopold was never formally charged for his crimes against humanity during his occupation of Central Africa, and it's seldom spoken about. Many will never know about Central Africa's colonial history, and that to me is a cruel tragedy. Here are the fragrances of nature that swell after rain and in the warmth of tropical air. Wet hardwood, oak, cedar, and mahogany, dancing with the rot. The Congo is an augmented sensory experience. To exist beyond sight is the most beautiful act of life, and one that is welcomed by the wild forests of Central Africa. Scent is the most interesting of all senses, for it's the only one to escape words. Even the air of the bonobos is sacred in my heart, and the scent of the Congo is the very essence of their life. When it rains, I stand outside and close my eyes. I breathe deeply to hold the scent of the wet earth in my lungs. The farther from the city, the better. And in her misty rapture, the earth gives me brown and green scents, my favorites. These are rainforest smells, and I dream of the bonobos. On my own, I've spent hours and days of such as these where I can creep alone, untethered, through the undergrowth of an imaginary Congo, seeing the bonobo society in all its peaceful grandeur. There is something divine about this place that must be conserved. The foundation of bonobo conservation can be broken into three strands. Remember, conservation is a slow and often infuriating process, and the desired results of your efforts may not be seen for years or decades. 
I've scaffolded the following three-strand survival plan so that people unfamiliar with conservation can become educated on how best to approach saving bonobos. Strand one is protecting habitats. For bonobos to survive, it is imperative that a large portion of our efforts be dedicated to conserving the wild land that the bonobos call home. This land does not belong to the land-grabbing international investors who do not care whether the forest lives or dies. Rather, it belongs to the various native Congolese peoples who've watched over its growth for thousands of years. The Congo Basin rainforest is one of the most critical ecosystems on the planet. It is the single largest land-based carbon sink in the world, and without it, our temperatures will soar and the rate of global warming will become unstoppable. We must put pressure on our governments now to ban oil and gas permits, unsustainable agriculture and crack down on the international funding of illegal logging in the Congo Basin rainforest. You can protest these issues, or simply share what you've learned about them with others. Raising the profile of environmental issues can pressure governments into paying more attention to them. Politicians in democratic countries respond to the interests of their voters. We must make it clear that we do not stand with politicians who perpetuate these horrific and inhumane acts in Central Africa. Plenty of charities are dedicated to raising awareness for the loss of rainforests worldwide. The Rainforest Trust, for instance, is a non-profit dedicated to protecting these fragile and irreplaceable ecosystems. The Rainforest Trust writes, Rainforest Trust and our partners move quickly to protect imperiled ecosystems and wildlife across the Congo Basin. With local communities, we protect vulnerable landscapes and wildlife in a way that aligns with community values and traditional livelihoods. Strand 2 is protecting indigenous rights. The most notable indigenous peoples of the Congo Basin, known as pygmies, have lived in the forest for tens of thousands of years. It depends on them, and they depend on it, and life is brought to them by the rich resources of this forest. Their stories say, look after the bonobo, and the bonobo will look after you. But since Leopold's occupation of Central Africa in the 19th century, colonialism, urban expansion, poverty, and civil unrest have encouraged farming, felling, and poaching in the sacred territory of the Pygmy peoples. Millions of hectares of the rainforest have been destroyed, and many Pygmy ethnic groups are struggling to survive. The forest isn't just their home. It provides their food and their medicine, and the very essence of their culture. Without the Pygmy peoples and their knowledge and love of the Congo Basin, the life force of the bonobo will be gone. We must help to fund organizations who can empower the indigenous Congolese to live freely and peacefully in the forest once more. The Bonobo Conservation Initiative and Lola Yabonobo have made it a part of their missions to help the native peoples and local communities in the Congo Basin rainforest. The Bonobo Conservation Initiative writes, The indigenous people of the rainforest are its natural stewards. This premise fuels BCI's approach to conservation and has yielded incredible results. BCI is dedicated to protecting bonobos while also benefiting their human neighbours. By listening to local insight, addressing local concerns, and fostering local leadership, BCI is helping spread a conservation ethic across the Congo Basin. Strand 3 is protecting bonobos. This is the most obvious point. We must raise the profile of bonobos in the public discourse. This begins with telling stories about bonobos to our families and our friends. One of the most essential parts of conservation involves educating others about the rich and sacred lives of the many animals who share our planet. Without bonobos, all life on Earth, including humans, would become immediately in danger of extinction. Bonobos aid in the reproduction of critical plant and animal life in the Congo Basin rainforest. The Congo Basin, as previously stated, is responsible for recycling more CO2 than the Amazon rainforest. This, of course, does not diminish the necessity of saving the Amazon too. Just like the Congo Basin, the Amazon is in danger of total annihilation at the hands of similar money and power-hungry lunatics. We must save bonobos to keep our planet alive. Right now, we are living through the single most important event in the history of mankind. Bonobos are known for their empathy and sensitivity to the emotions of others. These behavioral complexities provide bonobos with a brilliant set of evolutionary skills that are crucial to their survival in the wild. Empathy emerges in behaviours such as consolation, whereby third-party bonobos have been seen dissolving conflicts between unassociated subgroups. These acts of consolation often come in the form of sexual contact, social grooming, and the sharing of food. Bonobos have an innate awareness of how tension and conflict are counterproductive to survival and living. Bonobos are so peaceful, in fact, that not a single confirmed observation has been made of one bonobo killing another. In the world of apes, 
This kind of tolerance towards others, especially complete strangers or intergroup individuals, is a trait unique to bonobos. However, both males and females have exhibited competitive and sometimes aggressive behaviour towards strangers. Sometimes, intergroup females will form powerful coalitions with each other to attack a common target, perhaps an outgroup male who's become aggressive in an attempt to mate. Coalitions between intergroup females allow for typically peaceful intergroup relationships. Therefore, the male's usual desire for sexual intimacy are innately controlled by the female's ability to consent. If females are in any way coerced by a male, they'll become distressed and call for other females to help. The dominance of females in bonobo society is in fact so strong that male bonobos rarely attempt to coerce females into copulation through violence. Outside of copulation, female bonobos engage in sexual activity more frequently with other females than they do with males. Bonobos exhibit sociosexual behavior, meaning their mating habits are tied closely to factors like social status and trust within a group, much like humans. Same-sex relationships between female bonobos create close sisterhood bonds or intergroup coalitions. It is an exercise in trust. Bonobo pregnancies last eight months. It's not unusual for female bonobos to adopt other infants and raise them as their own. In the case of the most famous bonobo to ever live, Kanzi, who was born in 1980, was adopted by Matata shortly after he was born to Laurel. Infants will typically suckle from their mothers for four to five years after birth. Female bonobos leave their mothers and their natal groups at around seven to nine years old. This is done to avoid undesirable inbreeding habits. A male bonobo, however, will have a very close and lifelong bond with his mother. He will never leave her. All members of subgroups will teach young bonobos survival skills through interactions and play. Bonobo mothers have even been observed controlling the mating habits of their sons to ensure they sire high-ranking offspring. I find the fission of bonobo groups rather fascinating. Love roles is the term I've been using to define the forms of affection within bonobo groups, and at whom that affection is directed. The females leave their mothers upon sexual maturity, thus they leave the role of the receiver of motherly love to become the giver of love to a new infant. The males who cannot ever assume the role of a giver remain as receivers until their mothers die. Therefore, the fission element apparent within bonobo society sustains the two roles of giver and receiver of motherly affection between generations. Ideas like these are far more philosophical than scientific, but I believe that bonobos are deep thinkers who too possess societal fundamentals beyond scientific understanding. We know that without motherly affection, an infant bonobo will die. The same is true of humans. Motherhood in both of our species is paramount to our survival, yet it's not very well understood, and I believe the answer of how motherly affection persists can be found somewhere in this cycle of giving and receiving. A fine captive example of bonobo parenting is Loretta from San Diego Zoo. Born in 1974, Loretta is the oldest and most dominant female in her group. Her adult son, Erin, still relies on Loretta's power within the group to resolve his own personal conflicts. Loretta also gives us our first insight into pattern baldness in bonobos, which can be attributed to heavy grooming, old age, and genetics. Loretta, as the matriarch of her group, is subject to consistent and prolonged grooming sessions which have no doubt contributed to this hair loss. These grooming sessions are known as social grooming, which can be either mutual with two bonobos or polyadic with several bonobos. It's rare for this grooming to be reciprocal, meaning that bonobos being groomed rarely groom back. This kind of reciprocal grooming is found to be far more common in chimpanzees. Bonobos maintain grooming patterns and preferences within their subgroups. Grooming is used to form and maintain trust between individuals. Bonobos sometimes groom each other while face to face, which is also the dominant mode of sexual intimacy. The frequency of this intimate grooming, with a particular focus on facial grooming, is unique to bonobos. After the story about Loretta, you might be wondering how we should view captive bonobos. Right now, San Diego Zoo is the finest zoo establishment in the world. All North American zoos with bonobos should be AZA accredited and managed by the Ape Taxon Advisory Group, APTAG, which ensures consistency among captive bonobo populations and seeks to avoid non-educational or unethical keeping of exotic animals. We should note that exotic is not a term I like very much, but I'm using it because captive African animals are often described this way. The AZA is Ape TAG also makes sure that bonobos are not being bred or kept for unethical reasons like trade, and also so that bonobos in captivity remain accounted for. And this is the same reason why we don't support 
private zoos because there's no accountability for where the animals are and there's no consistency for when those animals need to be transferred to a new facility. Bonobos are some of the most intelligent animals on the planet. To live happy and meaningful lives in captivity, they must be provided with constant enrichment opportunities, similar to those found in the wild. Enrichment is a term given to activities that captive animals can partake in to meet specific social, physical, and psychological needs. Please note that enrichment occurs naturally in the wild as bonobos spend much of their time foraging for food, mating, or playing with their family and friends. This stress-free playtime especially includes the use of tools and mastery of complex skills like nest building and fishing for aquatic herbs. Simulated foraging activities in captivity, such as tubes smeared inside with peanut butter and oats, helps to keep bonobos healthy and happy. It's imperative that captive bonobos be provided with a range of enrichment and foraging activities to occupy their minds and stimulate healthy brain development. Ape Cognition and Conservation Initiative, where Kanzi and his family are housed in Iowa, provides enrichment, foraging, and husbandry opportunities to the bonobos. They're given the opportunity to partake in husbandry, which includes procedures like weighing, injections, scans, and blood pressure tests. Husbandry training allows the bonobos at Ape Initiative to become active in their own care and well-being. Allowing bonobos to choose whether to partake in husbandry reduces the stress of interactions between the apes and their caregivers, and helps to build reciprocal trust-based bonds between them. In the wild, bonobos seek enrichment through foraging and play. Tool use, or object manipulation, is one of the most common enrichment opportunities sought in the wild. For bonobos, tools are mostly used within social and comfort contexts. Bonobos might manipulate objects like branches during play or to shield themselves from rain. Bonobos do not use tools as often as chimpanzees and rarely use them when foraging. Common exhibits of bonobo object manipulation include dragging branches, placing objects in their mouths, dropping small objects, and throwing objects with aim. These actions are often done playfully or as a display to gain the attention of others. A bonobo is never too old for playtime. Even adult bonobos will play chase, or invent games with complex rules for their friends to follow. Adult bonobos have been observed covering their eyes and walking until they lose balance, much to the amusement of their friends. This game contains rules that can be modelled by one ape to another and used to build trust between individuals. Bonobos also love to tickle each other, and will laugh even in anticipation of being tickled. The physical act of being tickled is very different to the anticipation of being tickled. The latter, of course, is not a physical thing, rather, it is the idea of a physical thing that has not yet happened. This shows that bonobos can laugh at both physical and non-physical stimuli, which is a deceptively complex act of thought. Humans also need enrichment to live fulfilling lives. Now, more than ever, our lives are not being fulfilled as they should. We live idle lives, and the most damaging goal of the Industrial Revolutions has been to remove us from nature. We are wild, just as the bonobos are wild. It is only through the wild that we may feel free. Or, like the captive bonobos, we simulate wilderness, such as the pseudo-hunter-gatherer who goes for a walk along the beach on the way to pick up fast food, or the idle businessman who gathers a paycheck only to spend it on the next hunt at the supermarket. Try as we might to enrich our lives, we always fall short and none of us who live a tamed existence are very happy or fulfilled at all. We are akin to a pet bonobo in a small cage, unable to touch the only thing that can stimulate us, the wild. I believe we've now become so idle that we are afraid of stimulation altogether, and that everything will be attempted to further the disconnect between us and the wild. But there is always the call of the wild, as Jack London wrote, it is the undeniable hold that nature still has over us. We long to breathe clean air and sleep under the stars. We have been searching for the same feeling of love that comes from mother's touch or from shared fruit. These are the things that I long for. A permanent retreat from industrial society and a way of living that mirrors the bonobos. Much like humans, bonobos exchange vocal gestures to communicate with each other. Bonobos appear to follow the same basic rules of conversation as humans, that is, not speaking over others and vocalizing in a turn-based manner. The most significant feature in influencing the amount of conversations between individuals is their shared social bond. For instance, it has been found that young bonobos, particularly in conversations with adults, do not display particular variants of vocalizations. This may be due to younger bonobos being more emotionally compatible with other young bonobos. As much as I compare bonobos to humans, this isn't often helpful in convincing people that bonobos are worth saving. Should an animal need to justify its existence to us? 
Comparisons between humans and bonobos can be damaging because although we understand bonobos to exhibit human-like behaviors like excitement over favorite foods, sociosexual activity, omnivory, profound use of vocal communication, and so on, we shouldn't define these behaviors as belonging to human beings. An animal should not be of more worth because it is human-like. These ideas are the same flavor of psychology that justifies raising apes like human children. Lolia Bonobo is the only place in the world currently that's dedicated to rehabilitating and rewilding bonobos, mostly those who've been orphaned as a result of the bushmeat trade in the Congo Basin. Apes are particularly susceptible to the bushmeat trade as they live in groups, therefore a single successful hunt might yield several dead apes. Bonobos are also large animals with lots of meat, hence Lolia Bonobo has been necessary for wild bonobo populations to sustain themselves. For example, in October 2023, a small male named Lombo arrived at Lolia Bonobo. He had been rescued from wildlife trafficking. Lombo had no doubt suffered extreme abuse and neglect at the hands of his human captors, who had killed his family in front of him and imprisoned him to be sold as a pet. When Lombo was finally found by authorities, he was malnourished and infected with parasites. Under the care of Dr. Jonas Mokamba, who is the on-site veterinarian at Lolia Bonobo, Lombo has been on his way to a full recovery. He now looks at his surrogate mother, Mama Peggy, with trusting eyes. It's been especially hard for Lombo to trust again. Every donation to Lolia Bonobo helps to give bonobos like Lombo another chance at living in the wild. Because if Lolia Bonobo didn't exist, I think it would be a catastrophe. Because there are always the chasseurs who continue. But when we see another little bonobo arrive, it makes us feel bad that there are always the braconnets who continue et qui ne s'est pas encore totalement arrêté. Si on le perd, c'est fini, on le perd. C'est fini, on le perd, on le perd complètement, comme on est en train de perdre les gynocéros, les, 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 les des choses comme ça, par nous-mêmes. Bon, c'est pas bien parce que, vous voyez, c'est très important. Il y a beaucoup de questions que mes amis me demandent sur les bonobos wild, sont en fait reliées à la nourriture when plentiful fruit accounts for over half of a wild bonobo's diet. Bonobos also eat leaves, stems of wildflowers, worms, fungi, honey, and small fish. To help digest all of this plant matter, bonobos sport a modified hindgut capable of breaking down matter that's indigestible to humans. Bonobos have also been observed washing food prior to eating it. Foods such as meats, insects, honey, and fungi are sporadically consumed by bonobos and probably can't be considered a mainstay of their diets. And although bonobos cannot swim, it is common for them to forage in shallow bodies of water for the leaves and stems of aquatic plants. Much of the fruit and plant matter of the Congo Basin rainforest contains deficient iodine. Iodine is critical to proper brain development in both bonobos and humans. The aquatic herbs typically foraged by bonobos have been shown to contain rich and highly concentrated quantities of iodine, making it an essential part of a bonobo's diet. The life of a bonobo without violent human intervention is remarkably peaceful. Wild bonobos travel an average of 2 kilometers or 1.24 miles each day. The abundance of food in their natural environment means that bonobo groups can come and go as they please. Bonobos are highly emotional and intelligent, and these factors play a huge part in determining what an individual bonobo or group will do every single day. As a result, there's no one-size-fits-all approach to approximating the daily activities of a wild bonobo. But if I did, it might look something like this based upon the research of Takeyoshi Kano. The only thing we can be certain about is that bonobos need a lot of space and an abundance of food to meet their nutritional requirements each day. Bonobos will also usually spend time at the end of each day building a nest. This is done out of leaves and branches up to 50 meters above the ground. Bonobos sometimes regulate their temperature when sleeping by covering themselves with a leafy branch. This branch functions as a blanket to keep the bonobo warm as they sleep. Now, the ability to travel freely through the rainforest is essential to bonobo survival in the wild, so we must protect the Congo Basin rainforest and support expansion efforts by organizations like Lolo Yabonobo. The reality of participating in conservation is oxymoronic. While human beings, just like bonobos, seek pleasure and avoid pain, involving yourself correctly in conservation is a painful way to live. As you scrutinize the planet, you'll see more of what you ignored before, and in many ways it's like being born again. Suddenly, you're a different person to the one you were before. Bonobos have done this for me, and I'm often filled with such overwhelming sadness and distress that I cannot bear another day of this research. There will always be an undertone of doom to my bonobo endeavors. 
that is, the millions of universes in which their extinction comes and goes like a breath of wind. I tell myself that if bonobos die out, the world will end too. Perhaps it will, but a part of me hopes that we share the extinction. While it's imperative to understand the severity of the impending extinction, I think it's more important to have hope. I believe that the planet isn't healing because nobody has hope, and nobody believes that their voice, however small, can do great things. You aren't alone. You never will be. And I promise you this, we can save bonobos. We must. It is possible to turn your love for bonobos into a global movement of life-saving support for these beautiful apes. I'm not doing this because I enjoy it. While I do enjoy studying bonobos in the wild, the enjoyment I achieve from studying the good parts of bonobo conservation are often far outweighed by the bad. Every time we turn away, pretending that bonobos are not soon to be extinct or that this extinction won't be catastrophic for our planet, we become complicit in the genocide. I have tried here to provide a balanced perspective of good and bad, to direct you to further reading in the hope that you'll become interested in wild bonobos. The most important thing to me is that you value the lives of bonobos. You must understand that nothing is for us in this world. Nothing has been created for you, and the world owes you absolutely nothing. In times of increasing entitlement, this is imperative. We're responsible, and we must stand up. We must be heard. There is still time to save the bonobos. I owe a great debt to the bonobos for what they've given to me. When bonobos came into my life, I found perfect and final peace. Because my life now has meaning. When I die, if I have contributed to saving bonobos at all, I will have lived completely. To spend my one precious life loving bonobos means I will have lived a hundred thousand times in paradise through each and every ape. I will devote everything that I have to their survival. Let